I'm going to talk about, uh, for, for those of you that saw, uh, actually read the emails, um, you probably noticed that it said I was going to do a presentation on Dev, on, Dev and Think. And I want to explain why, the, why this whole subject isn't going to be Dev and Think. Um, several, about maybe a nine months to a year ago, we did some presentations on scanning and maintaining a paperless workflow. And um, I talked about Hazel then. I did an, a quick overview of Hazel using it to automate some stuff. And I thought afterwards, well, that's nice, but there's this program I've heard of called Devon Think. And Devon Think is even smarter. It uses artificial intelligence. I don't have to special case anything. It can just look at a, something and say, oh, that's like this other document you have. So I'll automatically file it and classify it. And that was all I knew about Devon Think. Um, so I. Uh, I volunteered to do a presentation in Devon Think, thinking that I would then learn how to use it and then do a presentation. This would give me a great opportunity to learn how to use Devon Think. Well, I started off, I found a very good book by, uh, called Take Control of Getting Started. And the Take Control series of books is really fantastic. They have them on all sorts of subjects relating to the Mac. And uh, they're sort of like the Four Dummy series, except at a higher level and much, much better written. And I heard an interview with the guy that was writing the Devin Think Man book, and he said, he said, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to write a book about, an instruction book about. He said, I don't even know where to start. He says, I've written all these books, and I've never had this problem before. He says, Devin Think is like a 50-page restaurant menu maybe a Chinese restaurant where, you know, it's closely spaced and there's 550 items in each page and there's 50 pages and all of it looks delicious. So I, um, I said, well, okay. And sure enough, after trying it, that was my impression too. It would be like trying to say, I'm going to give a half hour presentation on Photoshop. And at the end of Photoshop, of this, you'll know everything there is to know about Photoshop. Actually, it would be more like, just showing you in Photoshop that it can fix dirt and scratches off a negative, but that's all, that would be all I'd covered. So I, I actually sadly decided uh, not to, because Devon Think, here's some of the things Devon Think is. It's a file and media browser. It's a snippet keeper, a note taker, a database, a web browser, an RSS reader, a text editor, a search engine, an organizational tool using AI, an auto classifier, a web server, and a document OCR. Now, any of these subset of this could take easily a separate presentation. So it's just too big, and I'm not going to really talk about it because I don't feel I've got my hands around it, oops, sorry, my hands around it enough to do justice. And I hate making myself look stupid. I'm capable of doing that without, without much help. Um, I will say that Devon Think comes in three versions. And uh, there are a pro, a personal, and a pro office. Each one has increased cap uh, capabilities. The pro office one actually has the OCR and the uh, web server functions. You can find these things on sale a lot. There's companies that do bundles, and you'll see these software bundles, and very often you'll find Dev and Think included in one of those bundles, and it may be only 20, you know, the whole bundle may be $25, and that will include Dev and Think. So that's how I actually I acquired it. Um, if you're interested in looking into it for yourself, these are the best um, resources for it. And there's that take control of getting started with Devon Think too. at the end. Um, by the way, you have to excuse me. My allergies are bothering me. So if I do this, I'm not thumbing my nose at you guys. Or if I drink water because of, uh, it's got me dried out. So that's basically all I'm going to say about Devon Think for right now. What, what's going on here? What, what the heck's going on here? I don't know. Wait, 
What is, what is this? Oh, okay. Uh, Steve Klein, who used to be a regular attending, did this little thing that he used to call a quick tip. And I'm going to do two of them. First quick tip, a Cyber Mali quick tip. Does anybody know what you sh how to fix a Mac connector, like a lightning connector or something like that when the cable goes bad? Don't. Right. Here's what you do. You, you cut it off so that it can't be used and you buy a new one. And that's the first tip. Um, you can damage your equipment if you use a, or, or yourself, if you use a bad connector. It isn't worthwhile trying to save one. It's almost impossible to repair. If you have one and it's bad, cut it with a pair of scissors so nobody thinks it's good and throw it away. Yes? Can I add to that? Sure. <laughs> if you have an Apple cable that is no longer functioning and it is less than a year old, it can be replaced on your one year warranty on your phone or iPad. You can go into an Apple store with the cable and your phone or iPad so that you get your serial number. And they will replace that cable for you for no charge. Just don't cut the cable before you go into the store. Take it in one piece. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, here's the actual original one I was going to give you, and this has to deal with spam. Um, a lot of mail servers, uh, ISPs and all that, have a spam mailbox or a junk mailbox. And you may, and a lot of them have the facility that you can click on a message and say, this is spam and move it to the spam box. And in theory, the service will learn from this. And if you mark a message as spam, it should learn. Well, it doesn't always do that. And a lot of them, you actually have to mark the message several hundred times before it'll work. But what a lot of people don't know is with a lot of companies, when you put something in the junk mailbox, once a day and only once a day, they have a process that goes through the junk mailboxes, looks at the messages, and then adds them sort of to the junk mailbox, to the junk database that they use to classify these programs. If you put something in your junk mailbox, your junk folder, and you then delete it, there is a good chance it will never have been seen and will not help to train the mail service. So always leave it in for at least 24 hours. Uh, before you delete it. Now, this warning up here, which is a joke, by the way, um, I saw another email that went around once. It said, warning, if you go to, if you're on a web page or an email and it has a link to it that says, click here for Justin Bieber video, don't click it. It's really a Justin Bieber video. <laughs> so, I'm actually going to start out by talking about Q Recall. Um, Q Recall is a backup and archiving program, but it's a lot different than, than many of them that we're used to. Um, and it's different than the cloud-based ones also, such as Black Backblaze and what's the other one? That the big... Right. Yeah, Crash Plan. No, thank you. Um, Q Recall has a couple of unique features that make it very different. And I'm going to talk about the first one, data deduplication and compression. Um, Q Recall never ever stores anything twice. What it does is it's not really file oriented, it's data oriented. It takes, when it sees a file or data, it divides it up into chunks called, they call them quanta. And I don't know for sure, I think it's like 4096K, 4K blocks. It then looks in the archive, which is where it's storing the, or the backup, to see if it's already got that. Does it have that particular quanta? 
If it does, and it doesn't matter what file it was in or what operating system or what computer, it won't store it again. Data deduplication is used by enterprise systems. Anytime you have a corporate backup system, they almost always use this because they may be backing up a thousand different lap desktop units. And if they made a thousand copies of each one, they would run out of, of uh, it'd be very expensive. They'd need a lot of disk storage. So the most important thing they do is this data deduplication. And uh, the other thing that they do is data compression because we tend to have a lot of text files on our computer. Um, Unix, the underlying underpinnings of Mac OS, will tend to have thousands and thousands of files containing only a few lines of text. So it also compresses data as it is storing it. And here's sort of an example. I backed up this computer. Um, let's see if I can get this to work here. I, I backed up my computer and uh, for a test, I just backed up my documents folder. And this was a folder, a computer that had never been backed up before. So the way most backup systems work is the first time you take a backup, it backs up everything. And then when you do another backup later, it, usually it's the only backup what's changed. Well, it started, and as it backed up that first complete backup, Every time it read a block, it said, do I have this here? Do I already have this in my file, in my backup database, the archive? And, um, see if I can, see if I can get this thing to work here. It found 51% of the data on that computer, not the files, but pieces of it were identical. I mean, it may have found a text string in one file and another string in another one or something else. It may have found part of a, a JPEG that has two different names, but internally looks the same. So it ended up, it was capturing 13.4 uh, gigabytes in my documents folder, but it only wrote 6.66 .6 gigabytes out to the archive it found 6.81 gigabytes were duplicates. Now, I had previously run a program to detect duplicates on my documents folder. There were no duplicates. I don't have any documents that are duplicates of each other um, or any, that, that any of these programs that remove duplicates could find. But yet, this by, because of this operates at a block level, uh, quanta, it's very efficient. So that makes a big difference. Um, the other one is, let me get back out of this, come on. Sure. Yeah. Great question, great question. The answer is it keeps track of, what it actually does is it reads in a, a, a quanta and it computes what they call a hash for that. It then compares that hash, which is a unique, turns out to be unique for each 4K block with every other 4K block in its archive. And it then has another database which keeps track of all of this. It's sort of like black magic but when you ask for the original file back, it finds all of the pieces, reassembles them, all of the links, all of the catalog information, and restores it. This data deduplication is completely transparent to everyone, except for the fact that you're writing a lot less data. So 
Let me tell you what really got me interested in, in Q Recall. I have multiple computers. I have my laptop and I have my iMac at home. And I tend to take a lot of my data from the lap, my iMac and put it on my laptop so I can travel and do work on it and all that. But there's a lot of duplication there. In other words, a lot of my documents that I have on my main computer at home, I also have on my laptop. My operating system is the same. I'm running the same version of OS X on both computers. That means that almost all of the operating system files on my laptop are the same as my desktop unit. I do have more data on my desktop, of course, than I do on my laptop. But what you can do with QRecall, and what I've done, is I have one archive, and both computers back up to the same archive. So when QRecall sees the files that consist of OS X on my laptop, it says, oh, I've already stored those on my, from my other computer, from the, the iMac. So it doesn't store them again. This is different than, let's say, Time Machine, where, you, where Time Machine would make a separate backup of your, you might have, you would have a separate Time Machine backup of your, I'm sorry, your desktop and your laptop. But what you can do with QRecall is you can consolidate them all. It's smart enough to know, hey, you have this document on your laptop and on your main computer. I'm only going to back it up once. And furthermore, I'm only going to back up the pieces of it so that if they're different, I will recreate all of them, but I will actually only store the differences between the, 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 uh, the two. So um, that was one of the things that, that made it interesting and helpful to me. The other one is virtual machines. I run uh, Windows on, under Parallel. Some people run them under VMware and all that. And I have Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 10, and Windows XP, all of which are virtual machines that I can run. I even have a Linux virtual machine. When you run virtual machines on a Mac under Parallel or something, they create one big gigantic file which they refer to as the disk image, which pretends to be the you know, equivalent to the disk on a real machine. One problem that we've all faced with backup systems like Time Machine is that if you boot Windows and you just boot it up let it put on the updates or something and just shut it back down, you now may have to uh, back up a 20 or a 30 or a 40 or 50 gig file. And uh, even though all that you've actually changed might only be a few bytes in the file, because of to a file-based backup system, that file is changed. Well, QRecall looks at doesn't care that it's a file, it looks at data. And it will go through that whole 40 some odd gig or 50 gig virtual disk image and say, oh, I'm only going to say change, I'm only going to back up the bytes that have changed. And I won't back up that whole thing. And you can back up your virtual machines and you might see like a 70 or 80 percent are duplicated, or say 80 percent duplicate. And it may only write, I may do a backup of my Windows machine, and all that will actually be stored might be a gigabyte or two, will actually be written to the disk, not the entire 40 some odd. Now, somebody is going to say, well, my virtual machine system uses something called a sparse bundle. And without getting too technical, a sparse bundle is a file that is actually composed of separate, a bunch of separate files. Each separate file is usually about eight megabytes. They call them bands. And there can be hundreds or even thousands of these separate ones. And Time Machine and some other backup systems are smart enough to know, I'm only going to change backup 
the bands that are, you know, that have changed. So if you're using a sparse bundle, it's not as bad, but QRecall isn't looking at eight megabyte uh, chunks, it's looking at four megabyte, four K chunks. So it can, it has a much higher granularity and is able to do these things. Um, automation capabilities. QRecall, like many modern backup systems, is very configurable. It allows you to specify what you want to back up, how you want to back it up, and really automate that procedure. For example, I have a backup set up so that when I launch um, Parallels and run a Windows program, three minutes after I shut off parallel. Three minutes after I close down the program, it automatically does a backup of the virtual disk. And I don't even have to do anything. I mean, it's automatic. It's based on the fact that the program was running. I said, whenever this particular program finishes, do a backup. So there's a lot of capabilities there. Um, if we have time, I'm going to go back and show you some more of them. Um, we'll, we'll see what We'll see if I've got the time. Um, actually, what the heck? I'm going to show. I'm going to show you just real quick right now. Let me hide Keynote. All right, I'm going to launch Q Recall, and this is what they call their assistant. And I'm going to say, assist me. And this, it's going to say, what What do you want to do? And I'm going to say, I want to create, now this thing about schedule or not running is because I'm not using the ID I install it under. So we're going to ignore that. I'm going to say, create an automated capture strategy. And uh, uh, this will create uh, items on a regular big schedule and maintain a history of those items over time. So it says, what do you want to capture? Well, I'm going to say a folder, just for the fun of it. And I'm actually going to say I want to capture my, oh, where'd we go here? I'm going to say I only want to back up my desktop. And that's not realistic, but I'm just doing this to show you how it's set it up. I could also do a volume or the startup volume. Oh, yes, QRecall can restore a file, for, uh, a system from, you know, that has been completely hosed. It can do a live restore. In other words, it can restore the operating system while it's running. I'm going to do a continue. Where's the archive? Um, I'm going to choose an existing one, which I happen to have on, where is it? Got it on Snow Leopard. This thing called Mac Group Demo Quanta. That's the archive. And is the archive on a removable volume? Yes, the archive's on a removable volume. When do I want to do it? Well, one simple thing is every day at 2 a.m. Yeah, that sounds okay. How long should items be kept? As long as possible. This is uh, the archive grows as much as possible. How about keeping it 14 days and then deleting the items? What about keeping it five days and then less frequency for one month? This is a little bit like Time Machine does. Keep the most recent daily captures. Conserve space by only keeping weekly and monthly captures of older items. Should I limit this disk space the archive uses? Uh, yeah, let's discard the oldest items when the volume is over 90% full. Uh, based on your answer, we're ready to do this. Um, so, what it has done, and let me get rid of all these things here, it's going a little bit fun, is that it created a schedule where it captures a desktop, it compacts it, it merges layers, this is what's called a rolling merge, it verifies it, it has all these actions that it will automatically do, including repairing it if it needs uh, repair. QRecall absolutely doesn't want to lose data. So data is checksummed. Every time you access the archive, it is verified. 
there's an elaborate system of, of analysis and integrity. And it has the ability, unlike Time Machine, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of doing Time Machine backups and then all of a sudden one day it says, oh, sorry, your backup's corrupt, you gotta start all over. Believe me, it happens. Uh, Q Recall actually is capable of going back and rebuilding all those indexes and pointers and thereby repairing, repairing these sort of things when they happen. So it's pretty easy to use, it's very powerful, and uh, I get back to Keynote here. And I'm going to recommend everybody may want to look into it. It's um, that data deduplication, I was getting tired of buying new hard drives all the time, each one larger, because my backups were filling up. Yes? Actually, I have. I actually have, and they have a very good, go back into Q Recall here, did I leave it running? Yeah. They have, eventually, hopefully, our help, help system will operate. Here we go. Uh, Okay, advanced. Mm, restore Go SX. So they have a very, very good step by step help systems, and each one of these expands, booting from a different volume, restore what is a bootable drive, don't erase your archive, uh, restoring an entire volume, a live restore. How to restore using a recovery procedure, a live restore using Q recall, system integrity provision, mm -hmm. encrypted archives. Yes, Q recall does have the ability to encrypt your backups. And it also works with network volumes, by the way. So you could back up to a NAS. But they have a, um, they have a very, very good, well written help system here that is really quite helpful for answering uh, questions like that. Interesting thing, I when I restore a virtual disk, it's faster doing it from Q Recall than it is from a clone. And the reason is, is because on the disk, the, the archive, it's compressed. And when I restore it to the computer, it, it is faster reading, because I'm using a spinning disk and not an SSD, it is faster reading that disk, the, the compressed data off the disk, expanding it and writing it to the computer than it actually is to uh, copy a clone. Because if it's copying, maybe only half of them have much data. So it, that was actually a big surprise when I, when I saw that happen. All right, let's see where we're going now. Oh, let's see if I click play here. Um, Steve Jobs was quoted as saying, good artists copy, great artists steal. He's been quoted saying that a couple times, but as he admits, it was actually Pablo Picasso that said that. And the reason I'm about to say this is because I'm about to steal or borrow some pieces from some other presentations. I'm really a terrible typist. And if I were to type this in, it would take me, it might take me a month to do this. And if somebody else has already done it and done this wonderful explanation, I am not too proud to steal, providing, of course, that I've acquired, gotten permission from them, which I have. And it's time to talk about Hazel again. Now, I did talk about Hazel about nine months ago in the context of using it with a scanner to help organize your computer. We're going to go a little bit further and do some other neat things with it this time. I urge you to look at our YouTube channel for Mac Group and see the previous presentations. 
Um, just a quick review, Hazel started off as a series of cartoons in the Saturday Evening Post. In the 60s, there was a TV series. And then, eventually, We end up with Hazel. What does Hazel do? The program, Hazel cleans up your messy Mac, among other things. Let's see. Who's still sitting around typing in names of files and moving things to folders? The computer should be smart enough to do that for us. Well, then Hazel, it can't be. My dislike repetition goes back here. That's where Hazel comes in. Hazel lets you take a file on your Mac and automatically rename the file. It can even look inside the file for the date and then add that date from inside the file to the name of the file. And when you're done, Hazel can take that file and automatically move it into a folder so it's automatically saved. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Hazel can also make it easier for you to save files so you can view them on your iPad. Hazel can take music and save it automatically to iTunes. Or it can take pictures on your back and automatically save them to photos. Using Hazel, I can turn on music when I get home. Or I can automatically put my computer to sleep. You may not know it, but when you install a new application on your back, it often puts in obscure resource files that are kind of sprinkled throughout the system. Getting rid of those later is pretty difficult, but not with Hazel. When you delete an application with Hazel, not only does it get rid of the application, but all those resource files too. And later, when the application back, Hazel will restore the resource files as well. It's great. Hazel also lets you manage your trash can so it doesn't get too big. I am just barely joking when I say that my sneeze, Hazel will deliver a box of tissue. So to answer my original question, the reason you want Hazel in your life is because with Hazel, even by you know, you don't need to learn how to program, you don't need to read books. That's it, you don't need to read books. Um, by the way, that would have taken me about three months with my skill level to make that little 30 second presentation we just did, so. Um, let me mention, Hazel can create rules to automatically keep your files organized. It never take out the trash again, as they say. Hazel is actually a preference panel. It operates as a background process. It's not a separate app that you run. It appears in the menu bar at the very top. But, um, and it also, they did a really good job when they wrote it to make sure that it doesn't interfere with your computer. You're literally not usually aware that it's doing things. In fact, because of that reason, sometimes it takes a while to do things. You may do something and you're expecting Hazel to do something for you, and it may be three or four minutes, because Hazel was, they, they spent a lot of effort to make sure that Hazel didn't slow down your computer. And it integrates with iTunes, iPhoto, and Photos. Uh, let's see what next year. Hmm. Oh, here we are. I wanted to mention what they call App Sweep. I think I, I touched on this last time, but this actually I found is pretty neat. You can go out and buy programs, there's one called the Uninstaller, for example, so that when you install programs on your Mac, if you decide that you don't need them in the future, it will find all the pieces and get rid of them for you. Well, Hazel does that. It's just a built-in function. Except with Hazel, um, some of these programs like the Uninstaller, I remember on Windows there was some, some Mantech and Norton stuff, and they had to be running in the background when you did the install, so it could keep track of what you installed. Hazel actually can look at a program, go through the internal code, look at the resources, and figure out what other pieces of it are scattered around the computer. So um, 
to uninstall an application, if you've got Hazel on your system, you drag the application to the trash. If there are any support files from the thrown away application, like preference files or saved data states or things like that, you'll get this thing up there that says Hazel found files related to you know, some application name. Would you like to throw these files away? Un uncheck any you want to keep or select keep all to keep these files. And then if you click move to trash, it will move them to the trash. Now, what I really thought was shocked me when I saw it is maybe I threw something away, it's in the trash, an application, and then I went, oh no, I didn't want to throw that application away. And I think I gave that demonstration of this using Adobe Reader, Acrobat Adobe Reader, before I took Adobe Reader, I threw it in the trash. Um, Hazel said, oh, th there's all these other files that Adobe has uh, installed, would you like me to throw them away too? And I said, yeah. And then I said, no, I don't want to throw away Adobe Reader. Terry White would get mad at me. <laughs> so I took Adobe Reader, dragged it out of the trash, dragged it back into the application folder, and guess what happened? Hazel said, would you like me to reinstall all of those other, photo, other files for me? And I said, yes, and it did, and I now had a working copy. To me, that is, uh, that's pretty cool. I mean, that is, uh, not only that, it's pretty useful. This is called the vomit trans trans uh, thing here. Hazel supports Apple Script. You can write Apple Script um, in Hazel. Uh, that is, I'm sorry, you can write an Apple Script and Hazel can execute it or it can receive data from an Apple Script. For example, uh, the little video mentioned something about Hazel can put my computer to sleep. Well, how does it do that? Actually, Hazel doesn't have the capacity directly to put your computer to sleep, but you can write an Apple script, which has only three lines. Um, begin, what is it? Begin try. The second one is sleep. And then the third one is in try. And save that Apple script and tell Hazel when this condition occurs, execute this Apple script and put my computer to sleep, and it will do that. You can also write shell scripts in Hazel, for those of you that Apple script is too simple, and because Hazel will pass conditions to the shell script and can receive data from the shell script too. Or, if you want to be a masochist, Hazel supports JavaScript. Hazel also supports Automator. So you can write a workflow or a service in Automator, Apple's Automator, and Hazel can then invoke it or use it. So even in cases where Hazel doesn't have the built-in ability to do something, you can extend it by using AppleScript, uh, ShellScript, JavaScript, or Automator to do it. So you can do just about um, anything with it. And here's something really neat. Um, how many of you have Android phones? Nobody? Oh wow, good. I know it's a smart group, I know it's a smart group, but there's always a... Oh, I suspect one or two of you really have an Android phone, but you won't admit it. Well, one thing that we're used to hear about Hazel all the time is, wow, that's terrific. I wish I could have something like that for my iPhone or my Android phone. Well, guess what? There actually is a way to do this stuff from your, from your iDevice. Now, I like to know where my money is going because sometimes I look at it seems to have gone pretty quickly and I wonder, where did I spend all this stuff? So one of the things that I sometimes will do is I will take a picture of a receipt with my iPhone. I'll go to the pet store and I'll spend $100 on cat toys. Of course, the cat is only interested in the boxes the toys came in, you know, not, not themselves. And I will take a picture of the receipt 
And I want to store those receipts back on my iMac at home in a folder that I, a financial folder where I keep all these receipts. Well, what do I do? So here's sort of an example. Uh, Sheeta explained, gave a wonderful demonstration, what was it, about six months ago, of scanning applications for your iPhone. And I'm going to show one that's actually called ScanBot. Uh, ScanBot can, is the one you did, right? And it has the ability that it can do, it's on the bottom here, this is the iPhone. It's, I've distorted the proportions a little to fill the screen more. That's why it doesn't look like the iPhone. Uh, ScanBot can do OCR. So in a minute, I went to ScanBot. I'm going to plus, press that plus sign. I'm going to look in the camera and find my receipt. This is from Pizza Pepperellis. I'm going to find the receipt. It found it. It took a photo of it. This is what it looks like processed, converted it to black and white. It is now going to OCR it and upload it to the cloud. And it says processing pages. I don't know if you can see that. And it's done. At this point, it has placed it where I told it to place it in the cloud. This could be iCloud Drive. It could be Dropbox. It could be Microsoft OneDrive if you're a masochist. In my case, I used Box simply because I had a Box account and I had no files in it, so it was easier than showing you have you having to look at a hundred some odd you know files in my Dropbox. Meanwhile, back on the Mac, Hazel was watching that folder. And up at the top are my box sync files. And you're going to see that file I just captured show up under Hazel folder. There it is, ScanBot. Notice the name, it's, it's gone. It has now been moved into my document folders under a file called Receipt. And there actually is the receipt. And uh, don't know if you notice it, but it renamed the file. It actually looked at the receipt, found the date of the purchase, which may be different than the date I scanned it, took the date out and renamed it, found the fact that it was pizza, that it was Papa, Pizza Paparellas, found that and renamed, created a date that's it named, you know, Pizza Paparellas Receipt, created a folder in my receipts for Pizza Paparellas and placed it there. Now, that was from my iPhone. Now, where else this is useful is, do any of you download your bank statements or your utility bills or anything else? Well, sometimes I might do that from my iPhone. I might get an email that says, your Comcast bill is ready. And I sort of dread that. So I could actually, from my iPhone, go to the website, and there's a thing, download your bill or something, click on it, my Comcast bill would be downloaded to my iPhone, and because if it's a PDF file, I will get the option to where to open it. And one of the options that it will give you is open in Dropbox, or open in, you know, if you've got it set up, iCloud Drive. And I could then uh, click that, Hazel would process that file, rename it in the, let's say maybe in the Dropbox or so, rename it to something that made sense instead of saying statement one or so. And then if I look at my iPhone in my Dropbox, I now have the file named correctly that I can look at on my iPhone instead of a bunch of these things that just say statement one or statement, statement two, statement three or something like that. So it can be useful. Um, I don't know who thought of this idea of using uh, I, uh, cloud storage as an intermediary, but it basically allows you to, to process things on your iPhone. There will never be a version of Hazel for the iPhone because Hazel needs to operate at a low level and needs access 
to the file system and other things which um, the applications on, on the iPhone ought to allow, allowed to do. Now one of the nice things about this is it works from any sort of phone that would have like ScanBot is available. There's a version of ScanBot for Android phones. So even if you don't have an iPhone or you've got a tablet that's not, you know, another brand, an off brand, besides feeling sorry for you, you could still do these things. It works. And and that that was a game changer. I really just learned about this ability to do this recently. Um, so where do you buy, how do you get Hazel, and what does it cost? To get started with Hazel, head over to GoogleSoft.com. That's the developer's website. Uh, you can buy the application right off the website of the store. Hazel version 4 is $32, and you can get a family pack for $49, so five members of your household can run it. And if you've already bought a prior version, you can get an upgrade to version 4 for $10. You're going to have to buy Hazel directly from GoogleSoft.com, though. You're not going to find it in the Mac App Store. Uh, to sum it up in the Mac App Store application, you have to follow these very complicated sandboxing rules that Apple has. Uh, because of the power in Hazel, it simply can't do that. So don't look for it in the Mac App Store, go buy it from the software. There are some really good uh, resources for learning more about Hazel. Resources that are much better than, you know, than I am. How much was the family plan? I want some additional resources. I'll get, I'll get back to this. The first would be the Hazel forums at Moodlesoft.com. Uh, there's a great group of people in there who are always adding their own Hazel recipes and ideas. It's a good place to learn and share ideas, and even if you just have a question, you can go in there and post it. I've got some of them to talk about. Another good place is the Mac Power User Podcast. We included and I talk about these with a lot on the show. Uh, most recently, episode 322 is dedicated to Hazel Green 4.0. There's some great tips and tricks on that. Another good resource, and this is one I mentioned before, <coughs> was in the iBooks store. Um, David Sparks has come up with a book called Paperless, and this is a whole book devoted to automating uh, the best tools and workflows to get paper out of your life. And we talked about this before. This includes things like scanners, you know, how these various ways of doing it. But it does have uh, two really excellent chapters in it on Hazel, except that they are oriented specifically in using Hazel to process documents which you've scanned. And other than that, um, just a few weeks ago, any of you familiar with LIDA.com? Is it LIDA.com? Lydia.com. You know, you, you go there and you, you can sign up and you can see these video self-instructional courses that are absolutely terrific. Well, uh, David Sparks also put out just a couple weeks ago what he calls the Hazo Video Field Guide. And it's a two and a half hour screencast that teaches you everything you need to know about Hazo. Uh, you can start the screencast without knowing a thing about it, and by the end of the screencast, you'll be using Hazel to automate everything from filing your bills to having your Mac play some of your favorite music as you arrive home. And it is a terrific uh, screencast. I would highly recommend it because it covers a lot of the stuff about Hazel. For example, your favorite music as you come home? Well, there are some other... We're not going to get into automating your Mac and things like Automator, but there's also a system called If Then. I don't know if any of you have heard about it. It's actually a, a, a system where you can automate your iPhone and um, or your iPad. Um, and Using if-then, you can say, you can 
fire off a rule, just like you would something else, that says, do this when I get home, or do this when I leave my house. And it will use the, the GPS in your phone to determine that you've come home or you've lost your house. So one of the examples that they give here, one of them that he shows you, is using this system um, so that when you arrive home, it automatically fires off this rule, which invokes Hazel and tells Hazel, hey, I'm home, and then Hazel will play your favorite welcome home music for you, you know, the theme from Rocky or something like that. So by combining some of these other tools uh, with Hazel, it's just amazing what you can, what you can do with it. And uh, the screenplay covers, the screencast, I'm sorry, covers a lot of this stuff. It's, um, it's too long to go into now, but he does talk about how you can combine it with if then and other systems to automate your stuff in your Mac. Now, I've got a question. Sure. Since Hazel is a maid, will it go in there and clean up the messes that you've made before it goes around? You know, yes. Jump in there, will you Yeah. Um, the question was since Hazel's a maid, will she go through, I guess that's a she then. Um, will, will she go through and can she clean up messes that were made before she was around? And the answer to that is yes. One of the examples that, that they give in the uh, screencast is if you ever downloaded the photos from your iPhone to your computer into, I, you know, into photos or iPhoto or something like that, what are they named when they're downloaded? They're, they're, they're nothing human. They're like uh, something dash number. You know, there's no connection. Well, Hazel, they give an example of Hazel can look at metadata, any metadata that Spotlight can look at. And that includes for things like photography, the focal length of the lens, the f-stop setting, when it was taken, the geographical coordinates. There's a lot of data that you don't normally see and I'll show this to you in a minute. And Hazel could then look at, they gave an example of a, a photo that had a thousand photos in it. And Hazel went through them and looked at the metadata from Spotlight and renamed every photo so that it had the camera, you know, and where it was taken and the data was taken. Not the data was load downloaded or so, but the data was taken and it really just cleaned up everything and organized it. Um, this here, which went on over here, is uh, David Sparks, who happens to be an attorney. He's, he also runs with Katie Floyd a wonderful podcast called Mac Power Users, which I highly recommend. It's probably one of the best podcasts on the Mac at all. And uh, David did give me permission to use those little segments of, of the stuff. So let me go into Hazel and let's look at some of this stuff. Sure. Um, thank you for asking that. I, did I forget to pay you to ask that question? Yes. Oh, okay, darn. Well, anyways, I was just going to cover that. It's really terrific. That, and that, up until now, um, open Hazel. Actually, I could have done that from here because it's over here. Um, let's look at uh, Pizza Paparellas. Okay. So, Papellas, whatever you call it. So here's, here's Hazel's main window. And what you have on this side are what you wanted to pay attention to. In this case, I have it, I have this thing, and there's the complete, don't know if you can see it, the complete path to it. 
um, Mac group demo, box sync, Hazel exchange folder. And on this side, you have the rules. So I have a rule called pizza palace. palace. My mouth is not working. And if I click this little sign here, it's going to edit it. So um, let's say I want to see if this rule is going to work. We'll, we'll, I'll come back and cover all this stuff, too. A brand new feature in Hazel 4 is this preview button. And I can click preview. And it's going to ask me to find a particular um, document that I want to try doing it against. So let's see, on my desktop, I don't know, where is it? Come on. Oops, I didn't mean to click that. Sorry about this. By the way, I had a heck of a time doing this presentation because it turns out that if you're using QuickTime to capture the screen, and we are recording this, there's a, what I'm going to call a bug in QuickTime. QuickTime then intercepts a lot of Apple events and notifications. And I kept trying to do this thing and it just wouldn't work. For example, now it's intercepting desktop. It's not letting me get to the desktop. Uh, okay, well, let me move this to, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me put this in this other folder because QuickTime, the fact that I'm recording it is not allowing me to, is that a rule? no, no, this is something that works if I'm not recording it. So let me put this here since it's what it's looking for. All right. And let me, Actually, I need to turn off this rule so it doesn't move the file out from under me. Go back here to edit, preview. Okay, where is it? Yeah, I might have already moved it. Let me. Yep, it already moved it. Let me go get, I turned the rule off, so let me go get it back now. Uh, it's in my documents. Here's my, there it is, I'm gonna put it here, here, and I do I have it in? Let's see, oops, box sync is syncing it, okay. All right, let me put it back in this folder. All right. We'll try this again. Has anybody, by the way, ever heard of Murphy's Law for presentations? Yeah. And then that is... It's a rule, right. Even though it works at home when you try it and you reverse it very often when you actually go live, it won't work. So there it is. So now we click it, open, and what will happen is Hazel ran the rule matches against these conditions, and the check mark shows that they matched. If there was something that didn't match, it, it's going to go back and make it up. Uh, it would be an X there, and I could see if that's where the, the problem was. Um, let's look at... Uh, more general case. Let's make a rule. Um, let's make a new rule. Oh, plus. This, if those of you that use Apple Mail, this should look a little familiar. At the, at the top, you have this thing about what are the conditions that you want um, in this case. Up here, this is the name of the folder it's going to monitor. And that can be on a network volume, it can be a cloud volume, or it can be, you know, something actual there. And you can do any, all, none. And it's very, very rich. You can look at extensions, date added, date open, match. There's just a whole bunch of choices. You can all see there. 
it allows, including passes Apple script, JavaScript, shell script, and other. Now, other is interesting. These are the attributes you normally don't see, but Spotlight does. So these are like altitude, you know, negative value, the aperture value, the lens, uh, attachment names, type audiences, author address, codecs, color profiles. So this is information which is captured in the Spotlight database for any, for not only photos, but actually any file. And oh, here's even one for Devin Fink. Um, so, yeah, there's GPS there, there's somewhere there. I think it's listed as, as coordinates or so. I don't think it's under GPS. Let's see what it's called. Oh, there it is. There's a GPS version. Um, but there was like latitude and longitude that I, I looked in here earlier. So any of this stuff, you can also match on or select on. I mean, it's quite a, there's a lot more than what you normally see, and Hazel allows you to do that. Um, Hazel allows you to look at the contents of a file. Does a file contain something, does not contain, or it has this very powerful system called matching, where you can say something like, does this have a date, all right? Put a date in there. Now on the date, you know, so maybe I want something, I want a date that's um, month, no, sorry, month, followed by a slash, followed by day, followed by the year. <coughs> and for each one of these, it gives me a choice. This is 99 underscore, meaning two digits. Well, maybe I want the date to be long. There's 19, so there's this form, which has a four-digit date. So, uh, and you give the, I can give this a pattern uh, by, I don't know. And that information I can use later because it will go through the, the, the PDF file, it will find, or the text file, it will find that date pattern, and if it matches, um, I could move, here's the options when you match something. You can move it, copy it, rename it, sort it into a subfolder by name, sync it so that you could have two file, you know, folders look the same, upload it to a uh, FTP server or something like that, add tags, comments, toggle the extension, you can archive it, show it in the final, make an eye, import it into iTunes, and if it's imported into iTunes, you can say what playlist you want it into. Into photos, iPhoto, run Apple script, JavaScript, run rules on it, display a notification or something else, but let's say I wanted to rename it. Um, by default, it's going to rename it as the name of the file and the extension. Well, actually, I'm going to edit this, and I'm going to add, remember I created a custom pattern of the date called by. So if I put that over here, get the cursor in the right spot. Come here. Put by in the space. This is going to create the date that it took out of the file, the file name followed by the extension, except by default, if I edit the date pattern, this is interesting, it is going to rename it by default, and I can change this as year, month, day, which is the best way to file something according to date because it will sort correctly. You know, this is sort of the European way of, of doing it. So it would create that pattern, and then it would, it would create it as a date, the item, name, and then the extension. So it's very, very uh, uh, flexible and, and powerful. That's about the only words I can say on that. Um, it also has, let's see, can we get anything? Okay, we're going to save that. And there's my new rule. 
It also on the trash things, this is where it cleans up the trash. You can tell it to delete files that have been in the trash for more than some period of time. Keep the trash size under a particular size. And, and should files be deleted normally or shredded? Well, that actually, you know, that's a security. Enable app, app sweep, that's the thing where um, you throw away a program and it finds all the other files. So one example that they also gave on this is, let's say you, you're using Safari and you're at one of these sites that has software or anything else. Well, Safari only sets one download folder. For example, we have a folder called Downloads on my computer. And whenever I tell Safari to download something, whether it's you know a statement, a program, a picture, or music, it ends up in that folder called Downloads. Um, on Hazel, and I didn't set it up here, I have it actually on my other accounts, Hazel looks at my download folder. I have a rule called Downloads. It looks at the folder, it determines what type of file it is, and then takes care of it. If it's a document, it moves it into a file, a folder called Incoming Documents. If it's a DMG, if it's a music, it can put it in iTunes or folder. If it's a DMG file, meaning it's probably software, it puts it into a folder called DMG, but then it deletes it. I tell it to delete it after seven days because I usually don't want to keep the DMG file, but what I want to do is install the software. So it's sort of um, another, I mean, that's sort of an example. Another example I've seen is, suppose you have files in Dropbox and you want to share them. You're putting a file up in Dropbox because you want to share it with somebody. Well, if you're like me, you might do that and then forget about it, and that file is then shared forever with that person. Hazel, you could easily set up a rule so that you could move the file to Dropbox, share it, and then Hazel would delete it after a week. So you end up not having your Dropbox full of these shared files, which you only put there for a little while. It is amazingly flexible. Um, I haven't learned all you can do with it. I ran across, it was this brand new screencast two weeks ago, which I started reading and watching, and it was really helpful. Hazel also can do notification options. It can display things and growl or the notification center. It, of course, checks for updates. And um, yeah, that's about a visit website. I'm going to do this because I think you had a question how much it was. I just couldn't read what the family cost was. Yeah, so let's do that right now. All right, automated organization store. Okay, the family four pack is forty nine dollars. Um, the single license is thirty two, and a single license does include you can install it on two computers. You can install it on, for example, I have a single Hazel license, and that allows me to install it on both my iMac and my laptop. Now, what happens if you're using one computer with more than one family member using that computer? Well, I think this family, uh, four family pack is designed for several different computers, you know, if everybody's got their own. Um, in this case here, I've got on my computer, I've got um, two different main, I've got three accounts on my laptop. I've got Mac Group Demo, I've got my normal account, and then I've got a non-privileged test account I use for testing things. And Hazel is, is, is accessible for, from any of those accounts. So I, I don't know if that answers what you're asking or not. Well, like right now, my wife and I have separate computers, but one of them is an L4, uh, I'm at, so that one's going to go. Mm -hmm. So my wife will probably become the second user in her 2012 because she does 90% of what she's going to do on her 
new iPad. Mm -hmm. So when I, the only time she's going to use the large screen is if she wants uh, the convenience of the large screen for something that she's building well, well, a presentation or something. Mm -hmm. She'll have her own desktop. But it's the same physical computer. It'll be the same. Yeah, computer. then you only need one license. You only need one license for, for that. I know it's it's confusing because some software you find out some software says you need a separate license for each physical computer, and yeah. uh, we're moving towards a trend. It seems that a lot of the software nowadays says you buy one license, you can have it on both your desktop and a laptop as long as you don't use them both simultaneous. And some of them enforce that, and some of them you know, actually look to see if there are another copy running, and some of them don't. Hazel doesn't seem to, to run it, but you need a... Um, the support on Hazel is terrific. Let me just add this. It's actually a single guy that's developed it. He responds almost instantly. The going back to Q Recall, it's also a single guy that's actually developed it. He responds amazingly fast. They have these forums. You ask him a simple question, you'll get back a very elaborate, terrific answer. The, the support for both Q Recall and Hazel is terrific. Brian, did you, did you have a question? Yeah, a little like to read there. The second line says, Hazel, four times in fact. The third line says, uh, guess what? It's a version. Oh. Hazel 4 is a version. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I was, I was going to say that's probably a mistake. They haven't. Uh, Hazel 4 just came out and he probably didn't upgrade the website, but you're absolutely right. That makes a lot more sense. Hazel 4 is the, uh, okay. the current release. So, um, yes. One of the things that uh, a lot of companies are doing now is to go to paperless billing and you go to the website and download the latest bill and it comes down as download.pdf.pdf. I have a feeling I may hire Hazel because that's getting to be a real pain. That's you have, to have to do every file individually and sort them and rename them as they come in or you'll get completely lost. Yeah, and not only that, I found cases where, let's say my credit card statement, it will get downloaded from American Express as statement something, just, you know, without a date or it'll be, and I may decide all of a sudden I need to go back and look at a statement a few months earlier that I hadn't downloaded. And I'll download that and it'll have like statement two. And there's no way of looking at the name for me to tell which month each one was. So that's really what I use Hazel for. I have a whole bunch of rules on my, not the Mac Group demo account, but on my other accounts that look in my download folder, see if it's a statement of some sort from American Express or my utility to the gas company or something like that. And if so, automatically process it by looking at the date inside there, the statement date, not the date it was downloaded, and then file it into the appropriate folder. Can you share any for Amex or cons consumers or Detroit Edison or any of those? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have it on this, That's fine. on this one, but yeah, I mean, I do. I can share the rules. Uh, they have a whole bunch of, in the uh, forums, uh, people have a whole bunch of collections of rules, and there's a whole section on the Hazel forum called, How Do I Do This? And somebody will ask a question, how do I process an American Express statement? And people will respond, well, here's the rule that works for us, or here's the rule for something else. I know people use, like, Evernote with Hazel. A lot of people use, like, using Evernote. And having Hazel then further process and categorize things and all that stuff. But I ran, that was one of the reasons. I mean, it's all Sheeta's fault. Because she was the one who first did that first presentation about over a year ago on using a scanner and how she got rid of all of her paper and her books and all that stuff. And being a pack rat, I thought, I really need this. And it was all her fault for getting me interested in then doing this. And uh, she, 
you know, I started looking at stuff. I bought this book, Paperless, and all that, and they had a recommendation for Hazel, and that's where I learned about Hazel. So it's... I had known about Hazel. I'd seen a description of it before, and I was never interested in it. It just didn't appeal to me. I mean, it was $25 back then, and I thought, eh, Hazel, you know, Shirley Booth, what do I need? I hate cleaning. Why would I buy a program that cleans? But it really has turned out to be one of the uh, best investments I've, I've ever made. If, as David Sparks says, I hate repetition, I find that if I'm downloading the same type of file more than two or three times, like a bill or something, I'll say, well, wait, why am I doing this? And I'll write a Hazel rule to handle it in the future. If it's a one-off thing, of course, I don't bother. But the ability of it to look inside a PDF file, uh, find information such as the name of the company or the invoice item, you know, numbers, or the dates of the actual invoice, or with my electric bill, the, the range and all that stuff, extract them and then use it to rename the files or to make something that makes sense really made it worthwhile for me. So let me just sort of finish this part. And one moment here, that's just almost done. Oh, oh, I think I did this, sorry about that. Okay, he's a great Star Wars fan. That's why he's shown there with his friend. I couldn't stop without this slide. And that's the end. Um, questions? Yes. Yes, because it can extract the elements of the date, each element separately, you know, the day, the month, the, the separators, and all of that thing. You can define, for those of you that know a little bit about pattern matching with text, uh, I hate to use the word grep because I hate, you know, grep makes me burp. Um, but if you know anything about grep or any of these other systems where it can process text and extract parts and reformat stuff and move things around, you can do most of that. You can do all of that in Hazel because if Hazel can't do it, you can write a shell script or an Apple script that can do it. And Hazel will pass it off, let the shell script do it, and then take back the information. Yeah, they even have a whole book on it. They've even got whole big, thick books on just how to write advanced grep and all that stuff. Um, full disclosure, I used to work on an operating system called MTS, Michigan Terminal System, and it had a text editor built into it, and in, built into the text editor was the Snowball 4 programming language. And Snowball was a very early language designed just to process text. And unlike grep, which is esoteric, you know, you can't miss, if you didn't know anything about grep, you couldn't look at a grep expression and figure out what the heck this is doing. Even if you know about grep, you may not be able to figure it out. But the, the MTS text editor, it was English-like. Anybody could figure out what it was doing and how to write these patterns. So I have a prejudice against grep. Can you Oh yeah, you can edit rules that you've already got. If the rule, if your order is already processed the file, let's say it's renamed the file. Uh, no, because once it's renamed, I mean, it, it, it's actually, yeah, because behind the scenes it's invoking our sync and all that sort of, you know. Um, but there's a there's something that prevents that, and that's called backups. Remember, like Q recall. And by the way. We've done backups before. I actually have Q Recall. I back up my computer with Q Recall because of it saves me a lot of space. I have Time Machine backups, and then I've got 
a clone backup, which I keep over at my mother's house. I take over there so it's off-site. Remember, always at least three backups of everything, one of them being off-site. Do you do a clone backup of your clone? Do you recall backup because it's a smaller file, or...? Uh, I actually have a bootable backup, but there's no reason I couldn't do a clone backup of the... Uh, because it's just a regular file. I mean, it doesn't have all the... The issue, backing up a time machine backup file isn't as simple as it seems because of these hard links and all that. If you just do a plain old copy, it ends up following all these links and you end up with something much bigger. But uh, the, the uh, archive for, gee, I was just going to shut this lid, uh, dog. Uh, the archive for Q Recall is actually a package file consists of a bunch of indexes and stuff in there. Yes, you can copy it and make backups of it. So that's all I've got to say. If any of this really interested you and you want to do another session at some time in greater detail on any one of the, the three, you know, let me know and I'd be happy to